I'm going to quickly introduce our next speaker, who thankfully, due to technology, is still able to join us for our conference. I had prepared a whakatauki for her, which is... Woo te kōtuku rerika tahi, e te ti, e te tā, homai te pēki paki for the Right Honourable Jacinta Ardoin. I'll do a check, just a quick thumbs up from everyone if you can hear me okay. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Um, first, I, I want to begin with acknowledgement of um, Te Pūtahi Tanga, Te Wai Pounamu, Ta Mark Solomon, uh, your CEO, um, Helen Lady, the Mayor of Dunedin, who I believe is with you, um, my MPs, members of our team, and Member of Parliament Ingrid Leary and Under Secretary Reno Tirakatini, um, to all of the team members there, the navigators, the wonderful people who do all of the work on behalf of Bano Order on the ground. Thank you so much for the opportunity to spend some time with you. I am so sorry that I'm not there physically with you in person. We headed off to the airport at six o'clock this morning and we dutifully sat there for two and a half hours hoping that the fog would clear. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't clear in time, not in the way that would allow me to be with you in some form. So we've opted for this, um, but nothing quite beats physical presence. So sign me up for your next symposium. In the meantime, though, I thought the least that I owed you is not to just simply speak to you from a script today. I did have a speech prepared. And what I'd like to do is just send that, that speech to you. Um, and instead, what I thought I might do today is try and spend uh, time with you in conversation. So a quarter all that is two way. So while I'll have a few introductory remarks, I'm hoping that we have some roaming mics in the room and that you'll be willing to ask me some questions. Um, in particular, because I'm mindful your theme of today's conference and talks over the next few days, are very much ones that lend themselves to questions of leadership. And I'm not particularly good about talking about that without questions that guide me uh, as to what it is you would like to discuss. So I just forewarn you, those mics will be coming and I would love to have your questions. My comments though today are very simple. I'll start with a quote that I often use when I'm asked why it is that I came into politics or what I see as my political purpose. It's a quote from the late great Norman Kirk. He used to say that all anybody really needs is something to do, somewhere to live, someone to love, and something to hope for. To me, that verse, as it were, uh, speaks to what it is that gives us our sense of well-being. Uh, that idea of financial stability and the dignity of financial stability and economic well-being. Well the idea of connection to whānau, to uh, community, and the source of hope that we can derive if we have those things and if we have aspirations and people supporting us uh, to achieve those aspirations. In my mind, that's exactly what you do. That is what uh, your organisation's mission is and what you are guided by, your mission of sustainable social change, is exactly what that is all about. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that in my mind, you know, though, that vision that you're working to every single day is one that I totally share. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why as a government we're working so hard sometimes well sometimes with room for improvement to take much more of a final order approach in what we do with our agencies as well and embedding that 
sense and that focus on well-being in all um, that we do. COVID-19 was a recent example, though, of just how important whānau order is to Aotearoa. Um, I remember when we were first discussing the fact that we may have to go into uh, a level of lockdown, the likes of which we were seeing overseas, and I remember the anxiety that I felt that despite knowing it was what we needed to do if we were to protect our population and our communities, knowing that we needed to do it, but also being deeply anxious about the harm that it might cause as well, that the further potential financial scarring, job loss, isolation, uh, concerns around whether or not those who are unhoused could be housed or those who may not have access to financial supports, how we would wrap that around those whānau. And we really knew that we were having to place a lot of uh, expectation on organisations on the ground in order to support that side of the government's ambition. We couldn't do it alone. And there is no way we could have achieved what you achieved during COVID-19. You had trusted relationships. You had members of the community on the ground who were able to connect with Fano. You knew when they needed help, you even knew before they needed help. During calls, I remember we had these you know, weekly and daily calls and Minister Penny Henare would provide a dashboard of all of the work that Fano Order was doing. And we saw you know, that reporting coming in of how many families had been connected with, supported, care packs, hygiene packs. I cannot tell you the sense of relief I felt every time I saw one of those dashboards. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for getting us through. We could not have done it without the work that I needed. Um, that brings me, it brings me though to the, and forgive me if I talk over your part, for some reason I can't hear you when you clap. <laughs> um, that brings me to the next challenge, which is vaccines. You know, if we want to continue to provide the protection for our communities that our borders have been doing and that our health workers have been doing and that managed isolation has been doing. We will need to move from a system that relies on a barricade that sits around us physically to moving towards us carrying our own individual armour. And that's what the vaccine does. The vaccine allows us, by being vaccinated, to have that own personal protection. And that if there are members of our community that can't be vaccinated, if enough of us have our own armour, we act as our own barricade for those members of the community who can't be vaccinated for whatever reason. That's why it's so important that we have enough people who are and we support um, uh, family, whānau, community to, to receive a vaccine. We've seen incredible work going on within uh, Māori health providers um, and you will have seen that and being a part of that. There are next tier of people we'll be prior, prioritising for vaccination. Um, seen incredible work going on to support rollout for our harder to reach communities. But this, I think, will be another example of where we will not be able to take on the next challenge of COVID-19 without you. We're openly looking for ideas on how to reach um, uh, whānau that might be harder to reach generally for our health system. You know, how we can make it as accessible as possible. Places and communities where we need to take our vaccination program. Leaders that if they take a role in being vaccinated will make a meaningful difference in demonstrating that it's safe um, and reliable. So uh, I'm really looking forward to working um, with you to ensure that that next stage is as successful as our first stage has been, as hard as it has been as well though. The final point that I wanted to make before we open up to some questions uh, is simply that despite the fact that we have you know, continued to acknowledge, and I hope you've seen that in the support for whānau order generally and the commissioning agencies for growing that approach, uh, that does not change the responsibility that I feel we have as a government to support the foundations of wellbeing. So uh, yes, that family-based approach, that community-based approach, that being on the ground with those trusted relationships is what you are so good at, but we have a role to play 
in making sure that we're doing all we can, for instance, to give the financial uh, stability that families uh, uh, need, uh, for instance. So that's why, in the wake of COVID, we move quickly on doing things like still maintaining minimum wage increases, extending the winter energy payment, increasing benefits, uh, and removing, for instance, the hours test for those who were receiving that in-work tax credit in case their hours dropped so that they were still getting that extra support if they were a low wage um, family. I still feel that obligation. So we know we have to do our part because you know, there's only so much we can do to support families to reach their aspirations if uh, we just don't have some of those basics right that every family should be able to expect including the financial stability, the enough financial stability to thrive. And so I wanted to reassure you that that work on our side as government will continue. My final word, I'll talk about wellbeing a lot, but that applies to all of you as well. We're very good about talking about the wellbeing of others that we work alongside and on behalf of. Um, but I've been reminded over the last three weeks the importance of looking after ourselves. Uh, I have an incredible team, but they work incredibly hard. But I, we would be nothing without them. And so uh, I want to thank you for acknowledging uh, Kitty Tapuellen, uh, who is, uh, I consider her a friend and a colleague. And she's reminded me how important it is that I look after our team as well. So please look after yours. Um, Please make sure you prioritise your well-being as well, um, because it is through you that we support the well-being of others. Thank you again for having me today. Um, please, though, let's use the time we have to have a bit more of an exchange so that I'm just not talking at you through a computer screen. Noreira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Tēnā koe, Jacinta Iyo Kupu. Um, Call Victoria to Hokuikwa. I've got the microphone. I can see you leaving, Ingrid. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps Ingrid might ask the first question. Just demonstrating that I've, I've got a reasonable connection here and I can still make people out. <laughs> so, Fano, I have the microphone here. Jacinda can only hear what's going through this microphone. So, please put your hand up if you have any questions that you'd like to ask. And I'd just like to remind you that we do have Minister Hinare joining us on Saturday. So if there are any specific whānau order questions that you might save them for Saturday. But the floor is now open to Whakawhiti Kōrero to have a bit of dialogue with our Prime Minister. Right, I'm going to walk over to our first pātai. Kia ora, ko Steffi Akuatahu, um, and I am nervous. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh! I was like, yeah, yeah, give it to me, give it to me. Now what do I do? Aroha mai. Um, you make me smile. You ask a really nice question, Eho. That's what okay. Hey, <laughs> cool. Thank you. <laughs> hey, um, I um. Wanted to ask, um, as we all know here, that there is a whakapapa of trauma that has happened throughout time. Um, my question is, um, we, we do also know, well, I, I know that there's a collective generation that have been brought through corporal punishment, therefore they hold this brick wall in between them and the next generation. There's kind of a communication breakdown and it's intergenerational trauma. Or I also know that there is an undercurrent of uh, bad attitudes, bad behaviours within the system. My question is, what is our government going to do about addressing that um, undercurrent of bad behaviours, bad attitudes towards Māori, not only towards Māori, because I believe we're all one. New Zealand is uh, here to stay. Um, my question is, what can our system do to relieve that undercurrent of bad behaviours, bad attitudes towards the kaupapa? Kia ora. Kia ora. A really, a really 
a really good question. Forgive me if my answer is a little bit long. Uh, my first response would be that unlike before, where perhaps we've had a hesitance to acknowledge that trauma, you know, whether or, you know, whether or not it's historic, whether or not it's, you know, you know, direct intergenerational from the experience within the state, my, my view is we have to acknowledge it and we have to talk about it. Uh, because there's no way we will ever create change uh, as Aotearoa unless we acknowledge it and talk about it. And a couple of examples of that, if we, if we take a, you know, if we go right back, one of the things we've not been good at doing is talking about our history. And so from, you know, that's one of the reasons when we came in, you know, really early on, you know, we of course saw the teaching of Te Reo Māori as a way to start conversations and build cultural competency, but to start conversations. And so we, we, we worked on helping our existing education workforce with upskilling in Te Reo Māori, and we've built the number of ambassadors there, and that continues to be a journey. But I wanted also to add New Zealand history, our history, our honest history in schools. It's taken us a little while to build that curriculum. Um, it's being trialled at the moment in different uh, kura across the country, one of which is my old intermediate school, and I had a chance to go and see that, and it was incredible to hear these young people having and learning their local history in a way that I never experienced. And that, I believe, will create, will start to sow the seeds of generational change. That's rolled out from the beginning of 2022. But that's, that's high level up here. I think what you're also talking about is much more direct. The experience of our tamariki and rangatahi in Kura, I also have concerns about. You know, when we did our, uh, we've, we've got a, a, a wellbeing strategy, which I know uh, that you were a part of helping to develop, and thank you for that. It's a rich document because 6,000 individuals and organizations told us what they thought mattered for our young people. And one of the things that came through really strongly uh, was, a, was experiences of discrimination uh, and bullying uh, and people not having, our young people not having an equal experience in our education system. Now that's, that's come through from Māori communities, but it's equally also recently come through, for instance, through the Royal Commission of Inquiry from our Muslim communities. So if we start dealing with cultural competency issues there and discrimination issues for Māori, I absolutely believe we will start to have a ripple effect for other communities who are having negative experiences within our system too. That's something that um, Minister Hipkins has taken and Minister Tanidi have taken responsibility for and really are really focused on because it is so clearly coming through for us now. And Calvin Davis as well, Minister Davis, who's been focused on this for a few years. The change there, I think, is going to take us some time, but we acknowledge it, and, and that is part of, I think, making a difference there. The third area I just wanted to talk about is just the historical issues and current with state care. You know, in my view, we won't change the system unless we understand what it did in the past, and there's no question. I mean, I've heard, uh, you know, face to face the trauma that our state care system has created. I was with just a week ago. Uh, a woman who um, uh, who talked to me about her experience in care. She was put into care at the age of three, um, had horrific experiences. Um, shared with me the fact that even though she had horrific experiences, she still went to the tangi of her foster carers that the state put her into, and she couldn't understand why, given the experience that she had, but, but perhaps she thought she was seeking closure. I think the state has a job to do to assist with that. We have to look at ourselves and the role that we played in creating some of that intergener those intergenerational impacts, but we have to give people the sense that we're doing that independently of ourselves. So that's why we've got that Royal Commission. Our job will be to meaningfully respond to that as well and make sure that the next generation doesn't experience that, those same effects. And I know we're all working closely on trying to make sure that we make a meaningful change within Oranga Tamariki because I know that's what we all want. Final thought, how do we do things differently in support of, of whānau? You know, for me, and you, you're already doing this, but we're trying to enhance, for instance, the support for our new parents. 
um, uh, we're rolling out uh, through our, some of our Māori health providers in the Hawke's Bay and in Rotorua um, a model of care that provides weekly contact pre-birth. It's, it's a more holistic approach than what we have through perhaps the traditional forms of well tied in tamariki ora, but it really, in my mind, actually is just a te ao Māori approach to care and support in the first years of a child's life. But again, it's really a final order approach if we if we boil it down. So more of that. We have uh, another question here. Perhaps maybe the last one. Uh, kia ora oh, te sorry, I'll, I'll make my answer shorter so that we can. <laughs> kia ora te um, it's just a softball. Uh, so we are final order in the South Island. Nine iwi working together with our Fano. Um, we just wanted to see how uh, the future looks for supporting um, and looking at the size of the whenua down here and the demand and the need that our whanau have, it doesn't get less every year, it gets more. Yeah. Because yeah. our whanau grow, there are more generations coming and there are more challenges in our communities. Can you give us any type of assurances for our whanau order, te butahitanga in the South Island and our support for the near future going onwards for maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 years? <laughs> well, what I can assure you is that um, we absolutely believe in what te butahitanga does. And we believe that uh, you have built you know, through examples of the whānau that you work with, um, but also through other evidence that's been provided, you are proving the difference that you are making. And so, you know, that demonstrable difference, of course, uh, you know, really commands that we continue to support you. Uh, what you're asking me is about the next 10 years of budget bits, and that's something that perhaps uh, Minister Pini Hinare might want to talk to you about in a little more detail. But, you know, what I'd like to see is gone are the days where we, where we ha hear this political debate about what you do and the value of what you do. I want us to move on from that to rather how do we sustainably continue the work that you're doing. Uh, and so that, that's my opinion. Okay, we have another question here on the floor if that's all right. Yes. Kia ora, Prime Minister. Ko Kate Grace Tokawingawa. Uh, whānau ora is a way to support tangata whai ora and tangata whai kaha. We know that and it's proven particularly in te wai Ponemu. We want to participate in ways that are meaningful to us and again whānau ora and tipu tahitanga support us to do that. But how will government partner and use this indigenous knowledge of te wai Ponemu and Aotearoa to roll it out to, put to the entire Aotearoa workforce that work with tangata whai kaha and tangata whai ora? Kia ora. Kia ora. You know, actually last year, this was a conversation that I had with, you know, some of those, particularly Wahini Toa, who have been involved in the establishment of Final Order. And if I could just uh, acknowledge um, all of those Wahini Toa, and um, I believe Dame Tariana may have been with you, and I particularly want to acknowledge her. Uh, for us, it's about you know, if, as I've said, we share that view um, that sustainable change is created through a whānau order approach, how do we embed that in those agencies that are working in that space and trying to drive that change currently, um, but may not be doing it in the same, and using that same model, but our, also how do we do it in a way that we are true to whānau order? We hear the turn of phrase a lot. I know it's often contested whether or not uh, when we talk about that approach, whether or not we're remaining true to it. And so for me, I think we have to keep working together to make sure that when we are, when we are working hard to adopt that within our agencies, be it corrections, be it oranga tamariki, um, be it the, uh, within health and soon to be the work of you know, um, a, a Māori health authority, how do we make sure that in adopting those principles at that level, we are staying true to the whānau order model and that's, that's a little bit where I think we need to keep working together because uh, I don't think we as government should be defensive if you ever raise your hand and say, is that really a final order approach? If you say it, be meaningful about it. 
but we have a commitment, you'll see in the way that we are doing work in those areas, that that is the foundation, that holistic approach is what we are trying to establish, but it shouldn't stop you being able to contest whether or not you think we're doing it properly and well. Oh, kia ora, Jacinda Putty Hunt here. Jacinda, bit of a, putting a bit of a plug in for the uh, Final Water Navigators. Um, as you, you'll be well aware that we have a, a very different model um, down here in, in regard to our Final Water approach with our navigators. And um, that, and you'll be well aware of the success of the Nav Final Water Navigators down here. That's been recognised by DHBs, government agencies, etc. Can you assure us going forward that um, if the DHBs and government agencies, etc., take on final order navigators, that that particular approach won't be diluted through bureaucracy and policies, rules, and regulations? Kia ora, Jacinda. Kia ora. Yes, because actually, what we're trying to achieve is is you know is the opposite of that bureaucracy and you know the confusion that can be caused sometimes with multiple um, multiple uh, lines of re reporting and so on you know what what we're trying to do with the health reforms and actually you'll have a chance to hear a bit more about this shortly what we're trying to do with the health reforms is acknowledge that there are some fantastic things about our health system but there are also some things that are very broken and you cannot deny that at present our health system is not providing for Māori as well as it is for other parts of the population. And that is wrong. And I can't continue, despite how enormous a challenge it is to try and redesign an entire health system, I still believe that I can't in good conscience sit by why we have a health system that, for instance, for cancer, Māori are worse off in every single category other than melanoma. I cannot in good conscience let that continue. And so that is why we have committed to what will be the largest health reforms that we will see, uh, I believe, in our lifetime, but with a complete focus on reducing and ridding ourselves of health inequalities. So I don't believe that we can do that job without a partnership approach with Māori. And that is something that will be different about this piece of work. Jacinda, I'm aware that um, you probably need to get going now. So do you have any closing remarks before we show our appreciation? Uh, my closing remarks are for all of you in, in the room. Um, and I'll just repeat what I said at the, at the end of my, at the end of my, my opening comments really, that I suspect, I'm going to make an assumption here that what motivates you is very similar to what motivates me. And I'm also going to make an assumption that that can be all consuming sometimes. And that um, it's probably uh, easy to assume that when, when you take on a, a job like Prime Minister that you, that you manage to sit above the personal. Uh, I, I never managed to sit above the personal. I still hear the stories of individual Fano. I still hear the stories of it individual tamariki and I know how that affects me so I have no doubt it affects you and I have no doubt it will frustrate you and exhaust you but also at times lift your spirit like nothing else can please take care of yourselves um, because we need you to keep doing what you're doing so um, my final request would be a commitment that you will do that Kapai. thank you so much show your appreciation